Okay, this is Michael Camo from Minionville. I'm here with Peter Cheer. He is the author of the Fixed Income Report. He is also the founder of TF Market Advisors, and he is our resident bond market expert. So um, today we had big news. The Fed did not taper. They downgraded their economic projections. So, Peter, it uh, looks like it took the market by, by surprise. Now, what do you think? Yeah, I think, you know, definitely caught the market by surprise. I think these everything about what the Fed did was extremely dovish. Um, you know, the fact that they took no tapering whatsoever really surprised people, I think. And also, we'll get into a little bit more, but I think it also disappointed the market, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But, you know, the fact that they're not tapering clearly indicates that they're willing to push more money at this. They believe somehow that their policies work, and they just need to do more of it. Um, you know, they also came back, and by lowering the growth rates, they pushed out their interest rate hike forecast. So, in June, there were four people who thought rates should be higher in 2014. Now it's only down to three. So everything about this is you know, very, very dovish from the Fed statement. So they're going to continue to buy all the assets they were buying before. They're going to continue to leave interest rates lower. They seem to indicate that they will let unemployment go below 6.5% before they pull off the brakes. So I think the first thing everyone's now doing is adjusting and saying, wow, you know, this is, you know, extremely dovish, extremely good for the bond market, seemingly good for the equity market. The other thing people, I think, need to take into context as well is last week's Verizon deal already put the bond market in a very good mood. Right? Last week, Verizon did that $49 billion deal. It's traded very well. The long bonds are trading around 110 or probably higher than that right now. So, you know, they're up over 10%. In a week, and I think that showed how much potential demand there still is in fixed income and credit, and this will just further that. So, I think from an overall standpoint, the first thing you say is, you know, this is definitely bullish for rates, for fixed income. You know, that whole chase for yield is back on. I think this makes everyone consider that the timeline could be much further than anyone thought before we see any sort of hawkish moves by this Fed. Um, so, you know, that's probably the biggest takeaway from that. On the back of that, I think, you know, there's some concerns that the Fed has really mismanaged this process. I think they tried, they seem to communicate a willingness to taper. I think Bernanke has tried to, you know, tell the market what to expect. I think if you go through almost everything that you've heard from the Fed over the past, you know, month, the market was positioned for tapering. The market could have withstood it. You know, we came out earlier today and we thought, you know, anywhere from five, maybe as much as, you know, 20 billion of tapering and the market would be okay. So I think people are very surprised that they pulled back from the tapering. The economic data, while weaker, you know, isn't horrible. Um, so it feels like they missed an opportunity to try and taper. I think we're people are starting to expect a little bit more political backlash. You know, you have to assume that the reason Summers was even a candidate at one time was Obama wanted to shake things up a little bit. We've all kind of fallen right back into the mode, well, okay, with Summers out of the picture, Yellen's the most likely candidate. I would not be surprised after today to hear a little bit more rumbling out of Washington that they need to shake up the Fed, that they need some new blood in there. Because so I think everyone was, again, expecting some level of tapering, prepared for some level of tapering. And there are a lot of people who do not think QE policy works. They are, and I mean, it's a little bit, you know, almost – illogical for them at this stage to say this policy, which isn't really doing anything wonderful, um, we just need to do more of it for longer. When I think there is a growing group of people that would say, hey, um, you know, maybe we should change this policy. Maybe it isn't working. We should pull back. The other thing I think that really is interesting is back in June when the Fed released their growth forecast, people were very excited about the growth prospects. They cut those already. So I think that will sink in a little bit and probably hit equities more than anything where if they're pulling back on growth and they're consistently pulling back, if you look at where the Fed thought the economy would be in 2014 last September versus where they think it'll be now in 2014, they've scaled back. So they've been consistently wrong. And I think they're showing you know, a pretty high degree of fallacy. They're, their models are no better than anyone else's. They're just guessing at the economy. And probably more and more, they're actually creating these projections to suit their agenda. So I think, you know, from a quick markets takeaway, I think rates products are in very good shape. I think, you know, high-yield credit should do very well. So you look at the HYGs, JMKs. I suspect that EM should bounce on the back of this. Um, you know, all the fixed income assets should do pretty well. I would say on equities, you know, the dividend stocks are probably even more appealing maybe now than 
fixed income. I thought they had been looking rich, but you have a Fed that seems very willing to back up equities, so I think dividend stocks. And then I think really the more interesting part is going to be trying to look for the LBO candidate. Earlier this year, you know, everyone was looking for LBOs. We never really got LBOs. We had Heinz and Dell, both of which were, you know, very unique. And, you know, in the one, Buffett really had a controlling interest already that he wanted something. And in the other, Michael Dell himself had an agenda. But I would start looking for LBO candidates as potential investments. You saw Verizon get $49 billion of debt done last week. There's that appetite, so you can fund it. And there's this clear, at least right now, perception that QE is on the table until at least the end of January. Um, so that could encourage the private equity. So I would think something like that becomes very interesting. I'm not sure that growth stocks benefit as much. Um, I would say that I expect some backlash from this activity. I think the people who have been anti-QE will be a little bit more vocal about it. His term ends January 31st, um, you know, so a lot can change, I think, between now and then. But th that's my initial takeaway is it's very good for fixed income, not good at all for floating rate products, good for credit, good for dividend stocks, and I would really look to LBO names again. Um, oh, okay, but uh, let's take a quick step back now. Bernanke said that um, – very interestingly that they have tools to manage rates and they can unwind the balance sheet when the time comes. Um, do, do you think that's realistic or do you think they're just buying time and he's out of here in January and it's somebody else's problem? Yeah, I, I, I don't think they will ever wind up selling a bond at this stage or certainly I think their only exit strategy is to have the bonds eventually mature and anytime it looks unlikely that they can mature in a reasonable way we will see another round of Operation Twist where they extend the balance sheet. I mean, they have almost no debt maturing within five years on their balance sheet, so I, I think it's really someone else's problem. They have this huge portfolio built up. They continue to grow it. I think he's probably, in fact, whether outright lying. And I don't believe anyone in the market believes they can properly sell this. And if you think the fact that 10-year Treasury is backed up 125 basis points, basically, just on talk of buying less, I'm not sure how you control it if you start actually selling. Okay, uh, questions are starting to come in, and I'll just remind the audience that if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A, and we will get to them um, as soon as we can. Okay, uh, we have another one. If the Fed raises rates too soon, uh, what would that do to things like shadow bank liquidity? Yeah, I think that's one of their big concerns, and that's why they've been very focused on the short-term rate is – there is so much leverage in the system, and people are financing short, you know, longer-term debt with short-term debt. So I think that's been a big concern of theirs, and that's why they keep going out and reiterating that they will keep Fed funds low. And by keeping Fed funds low, it also anchors the curve. It's why even through this whole, you know, Treasury sell-off, you never really saw the two-year move because the two-year is completely anchored by where Fed funds is going to be, and even the five-year can only go so far. So I think they're going to continue to try and anchor that Fed funds rate, convince everyone that rates aren't going up anytime soon. I think there is some chance over time they try and set yield, the yield curve. And, you know, when he talks about other alternative policies and ways of controlling yield, it would not be completely shocking for them to propose, well, maybe the two-and-a-half-year Treasury has to be 1.5 percent and we'll buy any time it gets beyond that. And that's a little bit more far-fetched, but I think things like that are possibly on the table with this Fed. Um, but, yeah, they are going to be extremely careful about raising rates. The one thing that I thought that continues to strike me is very interesting. When you look at the projections, the three people who thought rates should be higher in 2014 all put it at 1% or above. And that is one of the biggest backlashes I know that they're facing is whether it's AARP or you know, whatever the lobby group is, certainly for the seniors, people are pushing hard that keeping Fed funds below the rate of inflation for so long is detrimental. And there is a push, I think, and I, it could grow. And I, if they get an outside candidate in, I think that's the first thing they would look at and say, you know what, in spite of all this carry trade, in spite of the shadow banking that's relying on that, it's ridiculous that everyone is losing money by in their savings because of Fed fund policy. So I, I think that's still a wild card. I would still bet that that gets spooked at some time in the next year. Obviously, today is not that day. 
Uh, okay, I'm going to squeeze uh, sort of two questions into one, and that is, um, do you think corporate bonds are to are topping out and sort of related because it involves borrowing? We've seen a lot of companies announce big buy big buyback programs. There was, um, you know, Microsoft, Qualcomm, um, International Paper, and and a few others recently announcing fairly large buyback programs. Do you think we could get a surge if people fear that we're topping out here? Yeah, I think we're going to see – I actually expect we'll see a lot of that in the coming weeks now. I think companies – I think they were already looking at it. The Verizon deal was so successful last week that I think people will look to push. And what I thought was really interesting about Verizon, even more so than you know when Apple did their big deal, I mean, Verizon really pushed out the maturity. I think – I want to say almost 70% of the deal was 10 years and longer. Like they had, I think, $11 billion 10-year bond, a $6 billion 20-year um, bond, and a $15 billion – um, 30 year bond, right? So they are able to lock in that financing. So I expect we will see a lot of 10 and 20 year money being raised and 30 year money. If you can get it at four and a half, five percent, and I think people will be using that to buy back stock. So I think that makes perfect sense right now. Um, and I think people will be more comfortable doing it given, you know, how dovish the Fed was this week or today. Uh, okay, uh, next question is, you have been bullish on munis for a while. Uh, do you think that trade still makes sense? Yeah, and again, I think in the munis we particularly like and in the closed-end funds that have been trading at a discount, um, but, you know, we've liked MUB. I think we are going to start seeing this reach for yield again, right? We're seeing the 10-year come back in. The long bond's been performing reasonably well, so people will reach a little bit for a spread, um, and then in the closed end funds, to the extent anyone is worried about rate hikes causing problems for the leverage, that's all going to work in reverse right now, right? You're seeing the assets rally, and any fears about you know the funding rates should be going away. So I would expect the closed end funds that gap to do very well. I think you know same sort of thing when we've been looking at the high yield. One that we often look at is um, it's a Whamco fund, MHY is the ticker. I think you can see that you, that discount compress very quickly. Okay, um, another good question we have here. Uh, does this move reinforce the idea that we're just going to keep piling up debt until there's a big problem? <clears throat> and if so, is the best strategy to just keep riding risk assets? Um, yeah, I think sadly it seems that way. I, I mean, first, I, I don't think that QE is really working as they intend. I don't know why they believe in it so much. I am quite convinced and becoming more convinced that QE is probably somewhat deflationary because it allows too many, you know, cheap companies to survive, or, you know, sorry, bad companies to survive because they get cheap debt, that all it does is encourage financial engineering just like we were discussing where, okay, I'll issue bonds and buy back my stock because that's a simple strategy to raise my stock price, much easier than building a new plant. So I, I, I think QE is not working. I think it's a, you know, policy that they should have been pulling back from. I hate the fact that in the mortgage market, you've already seen B of A just let people go, JP Morgan let people go a while ago. And I think what you're seeing is a mortgage market that's effectively becoming cornered by the Fed. And how do you ever wean yourself off that if you keep pushing the private lenders out? So I think it's a bad policy, but they seem wedded to it. And for now, I, you certainly don't want to fight it because it looks like you know they're wedded to it. They're going to keep doing it. And it is good for yields and risk assets. Now, do you think they they just feel like they've they've gone so far with it that they can't pull back? Because all right, well, um, this is, I guess, a personal question for me: is why do you think they didn't at least do something small, maybe five to seven billion, something in that range, just to, or 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 do you think they're desperate on the other side? Yeah, I, I'm definitely. I think that is my concern is that they've lost a lot of credibility. They had every excuse to cut back just a little bit. You know, they cut back, say, $5 billion as a token amount on $85 billion. I mean, the economic data is not great, but, you know, non-farm payroll was okay. Housing starts were down, but they're okay. We're not seeing any massive pullback. So I think they've lost a lot of credibility by this action, and I think people are going to be scratching their heads for the next few days trying to figure out why they did it. I mean, the growth doesn't look that weak. It, it feels like they missed an opportunity to take some off the table, actually prove that things are working. So, one, I think they look weak. Two, they have miscommunicated, which is not good for the market. Um, and, again, you know, people are going to question how bad are things if the Fed kept this up. Um, 
so yeah, it just feels like overall a very bad move by them that's going to be questioned over time. And I think we'll have some, you know, backlash from people who disagree with this policy in the first place. Okay. Um, given that you think of um, that the Fed lost credibility, uh, what's your sense on on real estate? I know that um, you've been focusing a lot on mortgage rates lately. So, um, how do you think this affects um, real estate and housing? You know, may right now I think we'll see a slight improvement in mortgage rates. Will that be enough to get another little wave of buying? Possibly, but I, I don't think they've done enough to really drive mortgage rates back to where they were. And I think until we see real job improvement, housing is going to do okay. I mean, you know, we've got household formation. We have all those things going. Mortgage rates are reasonably priced. I just don't see this huge rush for housing. So I think we're going to see this continued slowdown. And I think in May when we saw that rates first start ticking up, I think that drove a lot of demand forward. People who had been on the fence or undecided decided to capture the low rates while they could. So I think, well, we're at these new rates. Until we see real job growth, we're not going to see much more in the way of housing. And unfortunately, I think it's a bit of a vicious circle that housing was the one industry creating really good jobs that were actually high-paying jobs that led to other jobs that led to, you know, Ford 150 pickup truck purchases, et cetera. So I think we're going to see some economic slowdown, and housing is going to be part of the problem. Okay. Um, and from an kind of an equity bubble perspective, are you concerned that, since the Fed is basically signaling um, weak real economy, yet S&P just broke out to a new all-time high, are do you worry that we're that divide is kind of growing between, between yeah, I'm, stocks and the real economy? Yeah, I'm very worried about that, and I'm much more comfortable, believe it or not. You know, I think emerging markets, all the assets that have been beat up, I think offer better value. I think you can look to emerging markets. I think in Europe, even I think Spain or Italy offer much better risk reward potential. Um, and yeah, I think that's going to be one reason why I think high yield bonds, for example, I like on the back of this because they benefit from, you know, an okay economy. They benefit from the rate purchasing. Stocks, especially, you know, the growth stocks, that's why do you, they seem like they're getting overvalued. Why would you pay up for a stock that's already at a high as you're starting to see economic slowdown? So I, I think U.S. growth stocks are probably overvalued here and would tend to want to be in other markets. Okay. Um, so next question is, do you think the Fed will continue to target the long end of the curve? Yeah, I think they will. I think the 10-year has always been a focal point for them, partly because the mortgage market prices off the 10-year. I think now that more corporations are starting to borrow in the 10-year, they will target that. And it's just such a, you know, good headline number to focus on. So, yeah, I think they will continue to buy that, and they're happy to squeeze that market tighter. And, you know, I've got to evaluate a little bit where we are, but I think people will become very short again. Sorry, will become very afraid to short the longer end of the curve again if we get a squeeze. And I think, you know, I would not be shorting treasuries here. I'm not sure yet I would be long them again here, um, but certainly – it's hard to short the long end of the curve with the Fed clearly being very aggressive. Okay, uh, next question is, um, are there any asset classes that are specifically unattractive unattractive after this latest move by the Fed? You know, maybe leverage loans a little bit, um, but again, that's mostly a credit product. Um, It feels like, and this, again, I kind of lean towards I would rather be out of growth stocks, more looking at things like LBO candidates, look for cash flow, things that can be levered up. Um, but, yeah, certainly in the immediate aftermath, it seems most things here are pretty positive. Um, you know, again, would not want to own, you know, the dollar probably should weaken on the back of this. Um, but, yeah, it's hard to think. I mean, this should be good for most commodities. It's, I mean, Maybe you're supposed to uh, look to tips or something like that or something different that's been really beat down that no one's looked at. Maybe inflation will rise. But uh, on the first blush, I mean, they seem to have caught everyone by surprise and are much more aggressive than anyone expected. Okay. Uh, next question is, how would you rate uh, corporate credit quality? You know, it's declining. I think, you know, you are seeing the balance sheets grow. You're seeing leverage return. Um, so from that standpoint, 
you know, we have we are not as strong as we were a couple years ago. I think the fact that so many companies are issuing debt to do stock buybacks is bad. Um, you know, I think people are relying on this low volatility. The one thing I do like about the Verizon deal, the fact that they're at least borrowing for 10 years keeps, you know, any sort of roll risk away. I think companies that are borrowing more heavily in the three- to five-year space could, you know, become at risk. Right now, I think the economy is doing well enough that we shouldn't see any major problems. Um, there's not even too many headlines out in the high-yield space. So that's kind of where I'm watching. And that's the one element that we really haven't had is we haven't had a real credit risk fear and I think that's what's letting it kind of slowly build, um, where you are getting, you know, companies are levering up. The credit metrics are all worse than they were a year ago, kind of across most sectors and industries. So it, it's building up towards that next problem, but I think we're a ways away from that. And I think there is so much demand for credit again, and people really were not buying much credit during the summer because of the fears about yields. So I think there's a lot of money on the sidelines, to use that phrase, at insurance companies, pension funds that need to get put to work. So I think over the next three to six months, credit should do fairly well, away from these LBO names where you might find some opportunities to get short. And I guess if we're asking what things could be hurt, credit spreads on some of these names that could be LBO candidates, that's a potential opportunity to see some significant widening if those come into play. Uh, okay, and uh, we just have two more questions. Um, th there was some talk today that Don Cohn was potentially in the running. Do, do you do you place any stock in that idea? Yeah, and and I really look at the action today, and I got to believe that I have to believe that Obama or someone in Washington was not happy with the Fed policy, and for them to do more of the same seems almost a slap in the face to the administration, and I think there is going to be a big push now by anyone who is backing Summers and anyone who is even lukewarm on Yellen to say, you know what, maybe we need some new blood in there, maybe we need to shake up this thinking because it seems to become groupthink at the extreme. So yeah, I, I would not, as I was saying before, I would not be surprised to hear some more names thrown out there as potential candidates or replacements because... I think people are going to be left scratching their head why the Fed did this when they didn't seem to need it. And the people who have been anti-policy are going to, you know, get themselves worked up and push a little bit harder. Okay, and final question is, um, and regardless of how realistic it may be, who would your, who do you think would do a good job as, as Fed chairman, regardless of how realistic that choice would be? You know, I haven't really thought about that. I tend to be more reactionary on that. So, unfortunately, I don't have a good idea. I don't think – I do – Think or I don't think Geithner would be a good choice, though. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, he's, he's definitely another in the unrealistic category. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Okay, Peter. Uh, thank you very much for your time. We we uh, we, appre we always appreciate your help. And everyone, thank you for attending. We will post a replay on Minionville.com, and we will email it to you, so you don't even have to bother going looking for it. And again, thank you, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Thanks very much.